Okay, today we're going to be talking about the um, uh, the, the oracles of Sybil, the Sibylline, <laughs> uh, the Sibylline oracles, and uh, these were allegedly utterances of Sybil, uh, which of course is a legendary uh, Greek uh, pagan prophetess of the oracle of Apollo, whose ecstatic revelations were divined in a frenzied state. Uh, it is definitely a valuable uh, source of information for classical mythology, uh, oftentimes denouncing Rome's uh, idolatry and actions and so forth. But that's really a mixture of things. Um, mixture uh, in the sense that there are layers, various layers. For example, uh, there is a pagan layer. And then there are other layers and interpretations beyond that. Uh, there are various versions of it. Uh, of course, we have a Jewish version, which becomes uh, into a Christian version. Uh, so uh, what do we do with these oracles, right? What do we do with these oracles? Well, uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have to do this in a way that's much like a mystery. Uh, in fact, um, the oracles of Sybil, um, what happens is this. What happens is that is that going through these materials, and I've gone through it quite a bit, uh, what, I, what I've noticed is that there's not a clear way to describe these oracles. Uh, they're all over the place. And what I want to do is I want to take this step by step, inch by inch, and I know that at the very end, you're going to understand uh, these oracles better uh, than, uh, than some of the literature and some of the academic works that uh, claim to uh, try to encompass these ideas. But I found many contradictions. So let's just start right at the beginning with the word civil. <laughs> let's start there, right? So we're, first of all, uh, there are various theories of what this word means. Uh, one theory. Uh, is that it is a proper name of an individual female seer. But, um, you know, um, maybe. But, you know, that definition has been argued since antiquity. It's a, a point of frequent debate. Uh, for example, Pausanias argues about it. A second theory is that the origin of the word Sybil, uh, as provided by Vero, uh, is actually a combination. It has a Greek etymology. And arrives from the word seos, seos, which can be uh, a derivative of theos, right? Which, of course, obviously is God, and bula, right? Bula uh, becoming, of course, bula meaning council. And so it becomes sibula, sibula, which means council of the gods, you know? So you're receiving special counsel or advice from the gods. I kind of like that one. The third theory is that the word Sybil is, um, by, uh, according to modern philologists, uh, say that the word is derived from an ancient Italian dialect. I don't like that one, and it doesn't make any sense because uh, why would it be an Italian dialect when the earliest instances that we have of it uh, are going back uh, to the Greeks? I mean, it's, it's mentioned by Heraclitus of Ephesus, and it's mentioned by Aristophanes, it's mentioned by Plato. So no, I say no to that, but whatever. Uh, the fourth theory is that the word Sybil has a Semitic background. Now, so many scholars will say that the origins, the Sybil origins, come from Babylon, come from the Middle East. And where do we get this from a Semitic uh, standpoint? Well, you have the word uh, Sib, and you have, of course, this idea of ancient, and Il, Il, Al, Alal, right, which means God. So it could mean the ancient of God. <laughs> you know, words, uh, you know, who knows? So these are the traditions, right? Kind of floating around there. But um, I kind of, I'm kind of with Barrow on this one, but uh, you know, it's whatever you wish. Now, the tradition regarding the civil uh, uh, probably originated uh, in the various ecstatic movements that comes from uh, Asia. And as they move into the archaic Western Asia Minor, uh, and then, of course, it spread with the Greeks. Uh, 
the, the Sybil is first mentioned by name in Heraclitus of Ephesus. <laughs> by the way, uh, one of my favorite philosophers, he's the obscure, you can't step in the same river twice, you know, that guy, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, Zeus is, is Zeus, but he is one, and all that kind of interesting parts. He lived from 535 to 475. Uh, and he says this, this is a great quote, and I want to take some time uh, to say it. He says, the Sybil, with frenzied mouth, uttering things not to be laughed at, unadorned and unperfumed, yet reaches to a thousand years with her voice by aid of the gods. Oh, wow. I mean, that's a great, I mean, the Sybil, frenzied mouth, right? Uttering things not to be laughed at, right? You have to take it very, very serious, right? unadorned and unperfumed so it's it's raw it's 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 direct right uh it's honest yet reaches to a thousand years with their voice by aid of the god right so the idea is is that <laughs> uh is that it it foresees what's going to happen a thousand years from now, one of you who are listening saying, unperfumed, that's got to be blasphemy, you know. <laughs> unperfumed uh, means it's, there's nothing cosmetic to it. It's just plain and simple. But um, I'm, I'm thinking maybe the symbol could have wore perfume. Uh, but uh, oh, there you have it, right? So, you know, and the interesting thing is that the, this early quote does match a quote of who the symbol is all the way into late antiquity, that's made by a certain guy by the name of Iamblichus. Iamblichus, we'll be hearing a lot about Iamblichus uh, next week in the Chaldean Oracles. Apparently, I'm very much in the Oracles uh, right now. Uh, Iamblichus, who lived from 250 to 325, uh, says as follows. He likewise explains the same uh, ecstatic behavior on behalf of the Sybil. He says as follows. Uh, in like manner, Many also come to a perception of the future through enthusiastic rapture and a divine impulse, when at the same time so thoroughly awake as to have the senses in full activity. Nevertheless, they by no means follow the matter closely, or at least they do not attend to it as closely as when in their ordinary condition. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, they are not asleep. They are fully awake, and yet they're caught up uh, in the sense of, of rapture, the sense of ecstasy as they as they speak. So thus, uh, for the seer or the, the Pythia or the Sybil, or even possibly the, the prophet, right? The realization of these oracles, these prophecies, <laughs> are often accompanied by uh, ecstatic manifestations, while very wide awake, very alert, with all the senses seemingly engaged in the pursuit or reception of these spiritual messages. They are fully involved. They are completely there, aware, right? So, you know, so what happens now is that's the first reference to it, right? And then, of course, the last one. Uh, so we have the beginning and the end, and supposedly there. Um, so after Heraclitus, though, uh, so after Heraclitus of Ephesus, uh, 535 to 475, again, is his lifetime. Uh, it's that next mentioned by Aristophanes uh, in his work uh, known as the Peace. It's kind of a, it's kind of a, it's kind of a funny little episode. Uh, it's it's these, these guys that are are making offerings uh, to the gods and trying to do the proper way, and you know, libations first or the meat first, and they kind of get in an argument. Uh, with each other, and, um, and so about what the order is, and and Heracles uh, says, uh, "What oracle ordered you to burn uh, these uh, mutton in honor of the gods?" You know, and he's asking this question, and and uh, this guy by the name Trigenius says, "The god, the grand oracle of Homer," and he starts quoting Homer. And you know, Heracles uh, Heracles says, um, "He says I care little for that." Tis not the Sybil who spoke it. And so we have here uh, this idea that uh, the Sybil uh, has more authority when it comes to even the proper way 
of, of doing uh, rituals to the gods, uh, even that over Homer, uh, we, at least according to, um, you know, Heracles. But it's just interesting because Heracles uh, and um, Tigranius, they kind of get into this fight going back and forth, uh, you know, and until so the very end, <laughs> you know, uh, what happens is that uh, um, um, uh, Tigranius says, well, uh, I want you to, uh, uh, what is it? Oh, yeah, here's this. He says, you go eat the Sybil. <laughs> Because he's because uh, he's getting impatient about uh, he's like I want you to, we need to have the meat now we need to sacrifice you know use the meat offering right now and the guy says oh you know just just go eat the sibyl <laughs> like that's enough so they obviously don't agree but you can see that she is in a position of authority of course Plato oh, will mention uh, the sibyl in in uh, is Phaedrus Aristotle will mention uh, er, you know the sibyl in his problems uh, 954 but by this point. Uh, it's not one Sybil anymore, it's many Sybils. <laughs> uh, so it's a pleroma of Sybils, too many Sybils going around. Okay, so what happens now is that by the time we get to the first century BCE, uh, Vero uh, lists 10 Sybils, 10 Sybils. So, so what do we do with the, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, the sibling oracle. So what are you going to do with that? Because we have which one are we going to follow? I mean, you got you got you got 10 of them. You got the Persian Sybil, you got the Libyan Sybil, you got the Delphic Sybil, you got the Sumerian Sybil, you got the Erythraean Sybil, you got the Samian Sybil from Samos, you got the Cumaean Sybil, you got the Hellespontine, which is the, the Trojan Sybil. You have the Phrygian Sybil from Ankara, and you have the Tibertine uh, Sybil. That's from, from Tivoli, uh, north of Rome. So you have all of these Sybils, and you're thinking, do we have to go through these Sybils? Yes, we do. It's like, but we want to just focus on the one that's connected to the oracles. Guess what? In one way or the other, uh, <laughs> these will all be related. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just give you a quick preview, just quickly. So you're going to have, uh, you know, uh, a one version coming from uh, three of these sibyls, and then what happens is that these uh, these oracles are destroyed, and they kind of clam around, and they gather information from these other sibyls, and they put together yet another version. Yeah. So yes, we do have to go through these. So here we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let's talk with the let's talk about the Persian sibyl. Uh, the Persian sibyl is uh, really uh, shrouded in mystery. It's known by uh, different names. Uh, sometimes it's known as the Sambethe, the Helorea, or the Saba, according to Pausanias, uh, his second century writer. He refers to the sibyl as a Saba. Now, um, it's this. What's interesting about this, and it is, and this is really important. So important, I'm going to have a glass of water. And that is, this Persian symbol is sometimes identified as being one and the same with the Hebrew symbol. Yes, a, a Hebrew symbol. So here it goes. Uh, so Pausanias states. Uh, there grew up amongst the Hebrews above Palestine a woman who gave oracles named Saba, whose father was Borassus and her mother was Aramante. Some say she was a Babylonian, while others call her an Egyptian Sybil. Okay, so it's interesting because the word uh, Saba. Uh, if you guys know uh, the Semitic roots, right? Uh, it's derived from the Aramaic Saba, which actually means old, right? So it makes sense since the the Sibyls uh, who are always connected to women, right? It's always women, right? Are women of great age, really great age in many ways, right? So there you have this, right? In fact, uh, what will happen is is that this Sibyl this attribution will eventually go into the Jewish form of the um, uh, of the uh, sibling uh, oracles. So you're going to see that happening, uh, and as the possible uh, originator. In fact, uh, it is said that uh, 
uh, that she is connected uh, to, uh, in Jewish belief, uh, connected to uh, Noah in some ways. Okay. Now, according to Nicander, um, uh, this Persian sibyl prophesied the rival of Alexander the Great. You know, so, and, uh, and, and there, you have other parts too here. Uh, uh, in Jewish tradition, uh, she is asserted as belonging to the sixth generation of man and to be a descendant from Noah. Although uh, in other places, uh, she is connected to, um, um, uh, to be the wife of one of Noah's sons, right? Uh, uh, Epiphanius uh, regards her as the daughter of Noah, Noah himself, or even of, get this, of Eve. Now, the Jewish sibyl, however, uh, was uh, basically has a deliberately falsifies genealogy. Uh, so, but try to get as old as possible, try to compete with the other pagan perspectives. But there you have it. Uh, and there's this also these ideas that she's connected to the ancient Chaldeans. So that's so that's this this one. So we have uh, even though at first she will have nothing to do with the oracles that we talk about later on, she will eventually be very important. So just kind of kind of mark that in your mind just going okay so we, we're done with one of them the libyan sibyl the libyan sibyl is uh is connected to the oracle of zeus of amun at a place known as siwa and her name is femono uh and um what happens is that um uh, many greeks again including pausanias believe the libyan sibyl was the daughter of, of Zeus and Lamia, who was, uh, oh, who was also the daughter of Poseidon, but uh, who was also connected to the Oracle of Delphi, as well as the Oracle of Delos. Anyway, so what happens is, I'm going to go ahead and read this reference here. There is a rock rising up above the ground. This is Pausanias. On it, says the Delphians, there stood and chanted the oracles of a woman by the name of Herophile, and surnamed Sybil, the former Sybil, I find, was at present as any. The Greeks say that she was the daughter of Zeus by Lamia, daughter of Poseidon, uh, that she was the first woman to chant oracles, and that the name Sybil was given to her by the Libyans. Uh, Serapion, in his epic verses, says that this Libyan Sybil uh, says as follows. Uh, he says, even when dead, talking about the Sybil, she ceased not from divination. According uh, to Clement of Alexandria, uh, Serapion said that, uh, that what preceded from her into the air after her death was what gave oracle utterances in voice and omens. And on her body being changed into earth and the grass as natural growing out of it, whatever beasts happening to be in that place fed on it, exhibited to men an accurate knowledge of the future by their entrails. Okay, so what are you saying? So what um, what Serapion is saying, uh, as referred to by Clement of Alexandria, is when she died, uh, she was buried and her body rotted and grass grew on it, but, but she still had oracle powers. And so that whenever animals grazed upon the grass, they received some kind of insight, but since animals can't talk, the only way uh, they can get the insight is by the reading of the entrails of the animals. So don't you don't want to keep any animals off the the grass there, right? The the, the anyway. So now where is this oracle? Oracle of Siwa. Uh, it is it is situated uh, in the remote desert wastes between Egypt and Libya. Uh, it was. Um, uh, very important. Accordingly, uh, the oracle of Amon at Siwa was closely gauged its antiquity to that of Dodona and Epirus, claiming to be founded by a priestess that was snatched away from Thebes by the Phoenicians. We do find evidence that it goes back this far. According to Herodotus, the image within the oracle temple of Amon, known by the Greeks as Zeus Amon, was the image of the deity in the form of the ram. And here is where that Sybil spoke, right? Now, uh, 
yet uh, Quintus, Curtius, and Diodorus reports that the original form of the oracle was actually a, a, a part of a ring, which was embellished with gems, including the elusive C1 emeralds. Herodotus also mentions what he calls a fountain of the sun located at Siwa, which during the hottest part of the day supposedly ran the coldest, but it was it was very well guarded by the gods. In fact, here we go into a mystery. When Cambyses the second, uh, Cambyses the second, he was the son of Cyrus the Great, took over Egypt. He sought to destroy this oracle of Amon uh, that had this famous sibyl. So he sent out an army of 50,000 men to fulfill his wishes. 50,000 men. And they disappeared, never to be seen again. That's right. Some were lost in the western deserts. Pliny tells us that this was because the sacred stone at the temple was touched by sacrilegious hands, which caused a dreaded sandstorm to rage, right? But it's a very dangerous area in the middle of nowhere. Of course, <laughs> Alexander the Great, rather than wanting to uh, destroy this, this, this Sybil and uh, the accompanying uh, 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 oracle, what he does is he, before he is about to embark on his Persian campaign, um, he goes to consult uh, this oracle. Now, he thinks that um, his background uh, is from Perseus or Hercules, right? You know, you know, maybe, um, you know, Achilles. And he wants to find out. So he, he goes to Siwa, and what happens is, yeah, there's, there's rain, uh, and what happens is all the tracks are being lost. It is said that they are led into the desert and to the oracle by two talking snakes. <laughs> Although there's another version where it's uh, it's actually two crows, and they're led out by the two talking snakes or the two crows. I probably like to, I prefer the crows. I don't know. Although, although snakes can move pretty fast in the desert, I don't know. Maybe it depends on your on whatever your perspective. Anyway, he did get there. And he wanted to know, uh, you know, who was his father? Who was my father? Said Alexander the Great uh, before uh, the Sibyl uh, at this grand oracle. And Amon Zeus apparently roared and and because he's because he asked the question, is Philip, Philip II, you know, my dad Macedonia, is Philip II, is he my dad? He said, no, <laughs> uh, Philip is not your father. I am your father, uh, says Zeus. Okay, I may sound like Darth Vader. I didn't mean that, but uh, yeah, you had this idea. It's like, oh, he's like, wait. <laughs> so at this at this oracle site, he's like, wait a second. My father is Zeus. I'm half god. I'm a hero. <laughs> so not a zero. So, uh, so there you have it. Uh, as a crow flies. <laughs> no, it's not, I guess not. So what happens now is, is, which is fascinating, and I would love to take you on a field trip here. <laughs> you guys want to go out to the Libyan desert. Did you guys know that, that yeah, somebody says this is Darth Zeus. Did you guys know that this oracle site still exists? You can still visit it. And uh, uh, it's in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you know, basically, uh, you go through the desert, and there's this little oasis, very small oasis with these palm trees, and there's this huge rock standing out uh, in the middle of the desert, and there's a little village uh, that is around it that's been abandoned since 1926, uh, and uh, you climb up this rock, and at the very top is this oracle site, and it's all there, although the rock is starting to crack. Right, and the fear is that this oracle site is going to eventually crumble down uh, below over the cliff. So that would be very sad. But it's all there, so you could actually uh, climb it, 
uh, the outline of the forecourt with the procession of the gods where they once assembled was is still there. The facade's still there. The inter entry room is still there. So you can actually stand uh, where that civil uh, used to be. I find that fascinating. Okay, so that's, and this Libyan civil will be important. So her sayings will become important later on in the story. So again, earmark that. So you got the Jewish civil, remember that. You got the uh, uh, the Libyan civil, remember that. Okay. Now next, you got the civil of the Oracle of Delphi, right? And this is also uh, the civil was also known as a Pythia. Now, of course, Pausanias specifically calls her a civil because she does what civils do right? Uh, now, she is, of course, a sacred vessel of Apollo. Uh, it is required that she would be an older woman, as all the other uh, sibyls were, uh, had to live a pure life, and she was selected from the peasants uh, from the surrounding area of Delphi. Now, the Pythia sat on a tripod, and this tripod seat was positioned over an opening in the earth. Now, according to local legend, after Apollo slew the python, ooh, right, its huge monstrous body fell into this fissure, this opening deep down below. And here, the body of the python, as it decomposed, was believed to turn into fumes that arose and reached up to the Pythia, to this Sybil. And as she breathed in these fumes, it gave her the ability to communicate with Apollo, right? It's interesting because the word Python uh, is derived from the Greek word Pythene, which means to rot. Interesting, right? I have a python. You mean it's called? It means to rot. I have, actually I have a blood python right over here, right here in the house, just a, you know, just in the other room. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to tell Louis uh, that his name means to rot. He'll be very upset. Okay, so we won't say that. So, so as the Pythia took in the vapors, uh, she then entered into this trance-like state. She became possessed by Apollo, and so began to prophesy. Now, you know, taking a look at the site today, uh, scientists have, have detected uh, a uh, gas coming from this region that's high in ethylene, uh, which can, can actually rise from this fissure. And so maybe it's the source of these ecstatic <laughs> trances, you know. Uh, furthermore, accordingly, the Pythia uh, also drank the waters from the springs of Casotas. Um, and so you have that. And these, these waters are believed to uh, have special uh, powers, right? Now, while the Pythia uh, said her words, and these words were kind of all over the place, they were translated by nearby priests of the temple uh, in very elegant hexameters, right? Um, right. So uh, as, as for some of the recorded oracles, there are many recorded in ancient times. By the way, all the openings of these oracles begin with as follows. It starts with, God has ordained. God has ordained. It's interesting that, that uh, even though uh, the, uh, the Greeks are polytheistic, it's interesting that, um, you know, it starts with alethane o theos, right? It starts with, uh, you know, uh, God has ordained as a, like, like a big God. That, by the way, that'll be used later on by Jewish as well as Christian apologists, but we're not there yet, right? So first, uh, uh, the kinds of questions, uh, uh, you could, you, there's questions you can ask that involve life itself. Now, Apollo can answer these questions easily. So it's about life. The second were questions connected to the power of reasons, uh, reasons why things are happening. And those answers were not as simple and it became very mysterious. And so the idea is Apollo will give you clues, but you're not supposed to know the, the full measure of what it means. So there you go. So now you have this one. Once again, um, this is will become important later on. So now earmark, the third one, right? Uh, the Oracle of, 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 
Apollo at, um, uh, there we go. You got that in your mind right there at uh, Delphi. Okay, so now we move on to Didyma. And I've been to Didyma. I love that place. I mean, you got, I mean, you have an ancient temple dedicated to Apollo that is three times larger than the Pantheon uh, in Athens. It's still there. <laughs> Google, enter. Even though the roof's not there, oh, it's huge. It's enormous. It's a very uh, interesting complex. You know, you have this forecourt. Uh, you got, uh, then you have uh, an, an entry area. Uh, and then you have these two staircases. And on the other side, there's an open court. And that's where the Oracle used to be. And I've stood just at the exact spot of where I'm going to be describing right now. So a didyma. By the way, it's called didyma, which means twins. Because it was also, this area was sacred to Artemis. Apollo and Artemis. It makes sense. And they've just recently uh, discovered the Temple of Artemis there, just down the way. Although, in some cases... Uh, many will say, well, the temple of Apollo was still connected to Artemis, too. So <coughs> the sacred spring was located in the western part uh, of what's called the Aditan, or the courtyard. Uh, and archaeology has revealed that the spring actually shifted uh, positions, the Oracle Spring, where this civil used to be. Uh, so it was one position during the Greek and Roman times and another position uh, during the Byzantine era. Now, according to uh, the source of this magical oracle spring was from Mount Michele, uh, the water flowing beneath the Latmic Gulf and then supposedly rising to the Temple of Didyma, right? Also, according to local belief, the sacred spring was the location where Zeus and Leto made love, uh, which would eventually result in the birth of Artemis and Apollo. So where she sprung her maidenhood is where the spring now is located. Well, was located, but it moved during Byzantine times, but still the same courtyard, okay? <laughs> so they are romping uh, in this courtyard, very sacred, right? So we know specifically that a prophetess who was known uh, as a Sibyl foretold all the oracles. And we even have inscriptions that talk about that. Now, as for how the oracles were foretold by the Sibyl, uh, I will tell you exactly how. Yeah, you want details? I'm going to give you details. So early in the morning, the prophetess uh, or, or the, you know, the Sibyl had to first make a preliminary sacrifice to prepare uh, for her encounter, her ecstatic mantic encounter. Meanwhile, those seeking an oracle gathered before uh, in the what's called the pronouns, which is the front porch uh, by the east chamber. The requests were specifically written down and handed to somebody known as the prophet, who then went down one of the side chambers to the Aditan and one to the springs uh, with the prophetess awaiting him. As the priestess sat above this sacred spring, she was inspired by it, with her words then interpreted by the listening priest or priestess. So it's the spring that is inspirational as opposed to the vapor at Delphi. Now, Iamblichus, in his mysteries, specifically mentions that the gift of prophecy was bestowed, he quotes though, by vapor from the water, at once breathed in by the prophetesses of Brockendale, he says, revelation set in and the words began to flow. And of course, the word Greek word has this idea flowing like a river flowing or like a spring, right? She then spoke out the prophecy and then the prophet listened to it carefully and he wrote it down. The prophet then rose up the stairs again, returning to the east chamber with the three doors of the west chamber open allowing the consultants to see the upper back of the wall of the Deaton. This was much like an epiphany window. The prophet crossed over the east chamber and then spoke to the crowd below him, giving the answers to their consultation. So that means that there's a separation between uh, the Sybil 
uh, going through by the water, by the spring, having the oracles uh, and the prophet telling the people they're still a division. So they really don't see <laughs> what she's doing, right? Now, uh, Iambicus describes specifically what happens next, um, or actually during this period. He says as follows. Uh, he says, the woman oracle at uh, Brakandai, whether she is filled with the divine light while holding a wand first conveyed to her by some god, or foretells the future while sitting on an axle, or receive the god by wetting her feet or a hem in the water, or by inhaling vapor from the water, makes herself ready in all these ways for the reception and partakes of him without. Now, this is interesting. Okay, so you see there's a combination of things that she does, right? So she is, because uh, what happens here, it sounds like she's doing one or the other, but it turns out that she's doing all of these when you get to the last sentence. So she's basically holding a wand and then she's sitting on some kind of axle. And then she has her feet in the water along with the hem, part of that lower hem of her dress in the water too. So she is touching the water. And there's, of course, there's vapor as well. So, But she has to be touching this water. She has to be feeling this water. It's a tactile sensation, right? To really connect with the energy that's coming from this oracle. He continues, the number of sacrifices and the law of the whole consecration and all the other things done reverently before the oracle singing, so they're singing, the prophetesses bathes and her fast uh, for three whole days and her stay and the aditan already near the light and delighting in all so much time having a clear meaning. So she stays there for a while for all these practices showing a summoning of the God to be present and his wondrous presence even before she reaches the customary place and in the very spirit that rises from the spring, they reveal another God spate from that place. It could be read that she held the wand to be filled with divine light and keeps on going. So, and the whole magic art. So there you have it. So you have this mystical experience. I'm sorry, uh, sometimes I am looking, this can be a little wordy. <laughs> <laughs> and no English translation does very well with Greek, uh, but uh, there you go. So, so she is she has to go through the state, but there is a period of three days where she's getting herself ready for it. She has to be ready. So, Didyma is that important? Yeah, earmark that for later on. So there you have it. Then you have um, the Sumerian uh, Sybil, uh, C-I-M-M-E-R-I-A-N, Sybil. And this will figure in also later on. I'll talk more details about it. But uh, this, uh, this one is located near Lake Avernus. Uh, and, um, and so, and this is, of course, uh, connected uh, to, uh, actually, the word Sumerian, uh, it connects to the word, um, oh, I should say this one. No, we won't go there. I want to go through all these etymologies. <laughs> Otherwise, we, we'll get lost. Uh, what I want to say uh, is that those who were connected to these prophecies uh, were known as the Carmenta. Uh, the Carmenta, uh, this is also the name of the Roman goddess of childbirth and prophecy. Uh, this name is derived from the Latin Carmen, meaning a magical spell or oracle or a song. Uh, by the way, it's the root for the word charm, if you're curious. And so we're going to run into this one, too. We'll talk about her in a little bit more, too. But let's keep on going. So let's talk about uh, the next one. And I want to skip because I want to go to the Samian Sybil. The Samian Sybil. It's very confusing. Uh, the Samian Sybil is from Samos. Uh, and um, which is, of course, and she was said to have made the rounds to other places as well, uh, going to Kleros and Erethni and so other places too. Uh, but she's known as, as Photi, uh, which means in Greek, uh, indicates the wandering one. The Samian Sibyl uh, lived in a cave that's now located uh, in a Panagea Spilani monastery. 
which is, by the way, also connected uh, to the area where Pythagoras used to hang around. So Pythagoras uh, may have connected to the Sybil, right? Supposedly, though, this is important. Now, I want to make the, Sam, the, the Samos, the, the Samian Sybil, supposedly, the Samian Sybil um, uh, proclaimed that there would be the birth of Jesus and that it would occur in a stable. Uh, and, uh, and so this is part of this Christian legacy that we'll be connecting later on. Uh, Pausanias makes it clear. Uh, that um, uh, that uh, sh she is a near contemporary of the Libyan Samos that was born before the Trojan War. Uh, in her poem, she calls herself uh, also the one who is from Artemis and the wedded wife of Apollo, saying too that uh, sometimes that she is uh, Artemis's sister, and sometimes she is Apollo's daughter. So there's this a special kind of really deep connections between uh, Artemis and Apollo with her. According to Pausanias, the Sybil declared that her mother's line arrived from Mount Ida, while father's side originated for Marpessus. And so there you have Pausanias claims that it was this Sybil who possessed the greater part of her life in Samos, but she again visited various places. And her tomb uh, said as follows. Her inscription says, here I am, the plain speaking Sybil of, Pho of Phoebus, hidden beneath the stone tomb, a maiden once gifted with voice, but now forever voiceless, by hard fate doomed to this fetter. But I am buried near the nymphs and this Herms, enjoying in the world below a part of the kingdom I had then. And so there you have it. So, so you have this one. Now, you have all these Sybils. Let's get to the main symbol, and we'll see where we're going to go from here. And you're going, wow, that's a, that's a lot of symbols. Yeah, well, the symbol, the first, now, the first level of symbols that we, that become popular during Roman times, it derives originally uh, from the area of Troy, known as the Hellespontine Sybil, uh, which is established at the Oracle Apollo at Dardania. This is in Trojan territory. According to some traditions, uh, the Sibyl was born in the village of Marpessus near uh, Gergis at the time of Cyrus the Great and Solon, and so from around the 8th century. The um, sibling books attributed to, this, uh, to the Sibyl were believed to be composed during the 6th century. So so it is believed during the sixth century, the first version of the oracles that will later become famous in Rome is composed around Troy near the base of ancient Mount Ida, you know, the place of the Idean dactyles. So this collection, so this is where the inspiration is, is Mount Ida, right? Later, this collection was moved to Erythrae and would eventually, of course, connect to the Erythraean uh, Sybil. So uh, let's talk about the Erythraean Sybil. So you have the Trojan Sybil. Now we're moving to the Erythraean Sybil. The Erythraean Sybil uh, was established at the town of, well, Erythrea, uh, known as one of the 12 Ionian cities. Uh, it is, was understood to be a Minoan establishment. And uh, this symbol, his name is claimed to be Herophile. And um, she supposedly announced the divine parentage of Alexander the Great. And uh, however, you do have legends where she originated from Chaldea, all the way back to uh, the area of the Trojans, right? I mean, the area of the Persians, excuse me. Now, <clears throat> um, accordingly, uh, how uh, the very first time the word acrostic appears in Greek, and we use this word acrostic in the English language, actually is connected uh, to this uh, Erythraean Sybil. Now the Sybil writes the prophecies on leaves and actually arranges them so that the initial letters of the leaves always form some kind of word. Uh, they discovered this cave where she did her work uh, in 1891. It is an artificial cave. It has a 
water supply there and a basin was discovered uh, and various inscriptions as well. And one of the most important inscriptions that you can read right there uh, proclaims as follows of this uh, symbol from Erythrae, which of course will eventually become the one connected uh, to Rome. Uh, it says as follows, I am Sybil, uttering oracles, the servant of Phoebus, Phoebus, excuse me, which is Apollo, the firstborn daughter of a nymph, a naiad. Erythrae is my only home, and Theodorus was my mortal father. The mountain Kisaurus carried my birth, the place where I left the womb, and immediately spoke oracles to the mortals. While I was sitting on this rock, I sang for the mortals predictions of future sufferings. I lived for three times 300 years. Three times 300 years. Well, she, so she's claiming to be 900 years old. I, an unwedded virgin, and I traveled all over the world. But now I am again sitting upon my own dear rock, delighted by this charming spring. I like that. This inscription saying, I think this, this spring is kind of charming. I am glad that the time of which I spoke has come true. The time of which, according to my prophecy, Erythrae will flourish again and will enjoy good order, wealth, and fame through a young Erythraean who comes to his beloved hometown. Okay, so, and she's like, yeah, I'm glad, you know, look, and I, and I, you know, this is the best of times. Erythrae is a ruin today, but, <laughs> but for her, it was a great time, you know, <laughs> everything's great, yay. Don't, just don't tell her what happened later on, <laughs> you know, finding ruins everywhere and um, her cave just being lost for long periods of time. But it, the claim is that she is 900 years old and she's traveled all over the place. And she seemed to be of good humor, not, not so crotchety. I mean, she's enjoying uh, the delightful spring all that time. I, I get tired of the bubbling br brook uh, after all these years. But then again, maybe that's why she traveled around, right? Okay. So, of course, a lot of, a lot of people, uh, Pausanias actually saw this <laughs> very inscription. And he said, I think he, he doubts it's all true. You know, he's, he's all, you know, but uh, there you have it. Uh, always controversy. Uh, but there you have it. Okay, so what will happen now is that these oracles, right, these oracles will then go from uh, Erythrae and be brought to Cume in Italy, where they become very important to the Romans. So it starts at Troy, uh, near Troy, I should say, uh, around Mount, Mount Ida, <clears throat> the Trojan territories, where the, the, these oracles are written. Uh, there and then it's going to Erythrae and finally then on to Cume and Rome and root Cume and then to Rome. So that's kind of the order of how things work. Okay, so here we go. So now we get to Rome. According to the Romans, uh, the oracles uh, arrived, uh, came to Italy, came to Cume, uh, and uh, the Cume Sibyl was very powerful in Roman times very powerful. According to Pausanias, the next woman to give oracles in this way uh, uh, was called Demo, who came from Kume. Ovid, uh, by the way, uh, tells what happens uh, to this poor Sybil uh, who was living here. Her very sad fate. Uh, she ended up losing on the side of a deal with Apollo. Uh, so Apollo, being Apollo, sought her virginity and he, you know, and he offered her any wish in exchange. <laughs> and uh, she says, uh, I pointed to a heap of dust collected there. And foolishly replied, well, she's pointing to a bunch of dust. She replied, as many birthdays must be given to me as there are particles of sand. So that's how, how old I want to be. And then she continues, before I forgot to wish them days of changeless youth <laughs> so he gave her long life and offered youth besides if i would grant his wish he said well, you know you forgot to mention that eternal youth <laughs> so hey you know i still want to you know be with you so uh, i'll throw that in and you know for for you know for good measure and she's all no i'm not giving up my virginity okay well then i'll i'll stay true to the first part of my promise 
And because of her refusal, he granted her wish in word, but not in essence. And so she lived a thousand years without eternal youth. <laughs> so when Aeneas uh, finally met her, uh, the, the famous hero uh, arriving from, from Troy, and of course, obviously, uh, uh, also from Carthage, Dido, uh, she was 700 years old and, and still a virgin. And uh, she didn't look very good, but <laughs> she just kept aging. <laughs> so according to tradition, uh, she would have sung her prophecies as well as maybe writing them on oak leaves. And then she would leave this, at, she leave the oak leaf um, um, messages at the mouth of the cave. So the Sybil, uh, this Sybil is connected with the famous Aeneas. We've all heard of the great Aeneid, uh, the, the third great epic uh, connected uh, to the Romans specifically, where Aeneas leaves the burning Ilium and he goes through various travels and he's supposed to, you know, fulfill uh, his destino, right? <laughs> he's going to found a great people, uh, that being Rome. But, you know, he kind of made ang gods angry and he, he ends up, thank you Poseidon very much, uh, he ends up uh, in Carthage, which later on become Rome's uh, mortal uh, enemy, and hangs around Dido, who's the queen there, and uh, they fall in love. But uh, does he choose his passion, or does he chose to choose? Oh, excuse me, Destino. Does he choose to follow his heart or follow his fate? You know what he's supposed to do, and of course he follows his uh, his fate, and he leaves uh, Queen Dido. She's so upset. She puts herself on their on their the bed where they made love, and she actually put it on top of a, of a of a funeral pyre. And as the flames are going up all around her, as she's sitting there in the bed where they made love, she stabs herself. I mean, what a way to go! Pretty dramatic. So very dramatic and traumatic. And so, but he continues on, and he wants to know for sure uh, if it's his destiny. Uh, to found uh, this 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 great uh, place uh, that's connected to, of course, the Roman progeny. So what happens is that uh, he wants to ask Dad. His dad may know. Of course, Dad is has, is dead, so he has to go to the underworld. In order to do that, uh, he has to consult uh, the the oracle at Kume, and this is, of course, one of the reasons why this will become important. Uh, to the Romans, and of course, the Sybil there is the very center of this. So, uh, the story is told. It's uh, 19 BCE. Virgil writes this epic, the Aeneid. He refers to the cave, uh, saying that uh, where this 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 uh, Sybil is, saying it has hundreds of openings. And um, and so here, the Trojan warrior Aeneas sought to learn his destiny from the Sybil, that, you know, fighting his father in Hades, wanted to ask him directly. And so what he does is that uh, he arrives at the River Styx. So he goes down, he arrives at the River Styx, the great dividing line between, uh, you know, the mortals and the dead. Charon, the grisly ferryman is there, waiting along the banks of the river, ready to take them over to the other side. Of course, you know, Charon is not sure he wants to, because, you know, there's one, one small little hiccup. <laughs> Aeneas is alive, you know, you know. So, uh, and so what happens is the Sybil intervenes uh, and says that, well, Aeneas is not just any mortal, but he is the son of Venus and tries to bargain with Charon. So Charon will ferry him over to the other side. His pedigree is important, and also he gives him some gold. He kind of, she kind of bribes, the Sybil bribes him. And so, uh, satisfied, of course, Charon uh, cleanses his vessel of all the ghosts uh, that were supposed to be taken across and takes Aeneas. And so they arrive on the other side, and the Sybil, by the way, is still there. So the Sybil is this guide, you know, and um, a very important guide as they go into the underworld. Again, this is going to be important later on. They run into Cerberus. This is the snaky-headed, uh, three-headed watchdog. 
<laughs> so, you know, uh, and uh, and so what happens is that uh, she basically uh, calms this three-headed dog, uh, giving them giving them like you know doggy treats. So that kind of calms things down. And then what happens is they go to the various levels. Uh, so basically, the the realm of the innocence. Uh, that's where the um, you know, so basically, and in, in Romans believe that uh, if you're a baby and you die, you immediately go to this realm of the innocence, and then you're just simply reincarnated again in another soul. And then you go. Also, this is the place uh, that was located of those people who were who were accused as guilty of a crime that they had never committed, and so it, and, it, and they receive capital punishment. And so what happens is you go on this level, and because you're really innocent. Uh, you are just immediately reincarnated again. So you're not, they're not, not there very long. Just this is the second level of Hades. This is the suicides, right? Oh, by the way, uh, uh, Adeus runs into Dito. Dito was not in exactly a great mood to see him. And so she just kind of turned his back and was silent. Uh, he didn't realize that uh, she had stabbed himself on top of a funeral pyre while laying on the bed where they made love the first time and many times after that so you know you can kind of get where she's coming from there the third level you have the morning fields right and this is where the, the the soldiers who fought who are slowly kind of moldering and going away and eventually you get down the civil leads them down uh to the great uh judge uh ramadanus uh the son of zeus and he says basically you know on the left hand side you got tartarus and which is the, not a good place to go. And he has, hears terrible sounds of like whips and dragging of chains, right? Groans of spirits and perpetual agony. Uh, it's a terrible place. And, you know, you get stuck going there if you do a few things. Uh, for example, uh, the sin of desertion, you know, if you desert, you know, leave your troops, you're going there. Defrauding an inheritance, accepting bribes, patricide, incest, adultery. That's where you're going. Uh, and in this place, there is fire, there is brimstone, uh, and there's drowning and everything else. It's, it's not a good place to go. You don't want to go here. So, in fact, uh, what happens here uh, is on the other side, you have Elysium. And Elysium is a beautiful place. It's a paradise. It's, it's, it's where you want to go. You know, it's the happy place. So, uh, what happens concerning Tartarus, I want to read this. Concerning Tartarus, it goes as follows. It says, Nor death itself can wholly wash their stains, but long contracted filth ever in the soul remains. The relics of vice they wear and spots of sin obscene in every face appear. For this are various penances enjoined, and some are hung to bleach upon the wine, some plunged in waters. Others purged in fires till all the dregs are drained and all the rust expires. All have their manes and those manes bear the few so cleansed to those abodes repair and breathe in ample fields the soft Elysian air. Then are they happy when by a length of time the scurf is worn away of each committed crime. No speck is left of their habitual stains. But the pure ether of their soul remains. But when a thousand rolling years are past, so long their punishments and penances last. While droves of minds are, by the driving God, compelled to drink the deep Lethean flood, in large forgetful draughts to steep the cares of their past labors and their irksome years, the unremembering of its former pain, the soul may suffer mortal flesh again. So, so what's happening here is basically uh, if you're in, in this place called Tartarus, you're going through purgatoria. That's right, the purging, purgatoria. That's where this word, this concept comes from. And so you're purged. Now, some are there, as you heard, a short amount of time. Because uh, if you're not too bad and you get transferred over, uh, to Elysium. Uh, sometimes you have to be there for the full thousand years, even really bad. But at the very end, everybody's released, not only from Tartarus after a thousand years, but from Elysium. And they're all driven to the waters of life. And these, the Lydian flood, it mentions this. So you drink 
uh, from these waters. Uh, lathe uh, actually means oblivion, right? Uh, but these waters are seen to be so uh, tempting, right? So the more you drink from these waters, the more you forget your past life until getting your fill as you drink, you forget everything and you're ready to be reincarnated as a newborn babe. There you have it, you know? <laughs> so, uh, of course, the uh, belief system, uh, there's a, uh, the Orphic Mysteries tells you how, you know, when you get to that position, don't go to the, the lathe uh, spring, go instead to the, the lake of memory. It's, it's, it's to the right of the palm tree. And we drink for the lick of memory, you'll remember everything. And once you remember everything, <laughs> I guess what happens, uh, you may be even free from this mortal coil and be released into the stars beyond. That's a good news. Anyway, so what happens is, the, by the way, the Sybil is still here watching all of this. She's the, she's the guide. <laughs> she's the guide, right? Kind of a big responsibility. That's why she's so important as it goes into, you know, the Roman period of the empire, right? You know, so... In fact, Ancassus, uh, his uh, Aeneas's father, shows his son the souls by this river, who are destined to become the leaders of Rome uh, through his family line, uh, under the condition, of course, that he fulfills his destiny. In fact, it uh, goes as follows. I'll just finish this up. He says, "Now fix your sight and stand intent to see your Roman race and Julian progeny. The mighty Caesar waits his vital hour." impatient for the world and grasps his promised power. But next behold, the youth of form divine, Caesar himself exalted in his line. Augustus promised oft and long foretold, sent to the realm that Saturn ruled of old, born to restore a better age of gold. And there it is. Wow, guess what? <laughs> the famous cave described by Virgil where the civil was, survives. What? It survives. It's still there. What? Yeah. Oh, whoa. Yeah. So you can, yeah, it was, you know, so, so let's talk about it, right? So, so, uh, or, you know, Strabo uh, talks about it a little bit here. Uh, first of all, Strabo is kind of given his tour. And as he's given his tour of the region of Campania, uh, he talks about this cave, but he also talks about another one uh, that's connected to the um, uh, the the other uh, Sumerian uh, uh, oracle. So 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 he's kind of floating around, and he's he's first of all he's saying okay, so he's talking about first of all the Sumerian uh, uh, oracle at uh, Lake Avernus, and he says a few words about it. I'll just kind of say this real quick. Uh, he says that uh, at Lake Avernus, he mentions that. This is where there's an Oracle of the Dead that was located here. And he mentioned that Odysseus visited here. Uh, he mentioned the fact that uh, uh, the natives used to add the fable that all birds that fly over this lake fall into the water being killed by the vapors. <laughs> you know, um, He talks about the fact that um, uh, you have, a, which is really fascinating, I do want to talk about this, that those people, that the Sumerians, uh, had in charge of the oracle, along with the Sybil, lived in an underground complex. He says that he lived in underground houses, and it is through tunnels that they visited one another back and forth, and also admit strangers to the oracle, which is situated, he says, far beneath the earth, and they live on what they get from mining, and from those who consult the oracle, and from the king of the country, who has appointed them fixed allowances. And those who live about the Oracle have an ancestral custom that no one should see the sun, but should go outside the cavern only during the night. <laughs> so anyway, yikes. So there is this underground. This particular Sumerian Oracle site, even though it's not the one at Kume, uh, what happens is it, it thrives for a period of time. And Strabo mentions this, but it is abandoned. And many scholars will say what happens is that the focus then shifts from Lake Aventine to the Oracle of Kume, got it, which is nearby. So you have this shifting. This earlier one, 
uh, you know, is underground. So this newer one has to be underground too, as well. So let's take a look at this one. Now, if you can ever, if you ever have a chance to visit this Oracle site, just think about the Sybil uh, that used to be here. But this particular cave of the Sybil comes from the sixth century BCE. So it is, it is later. And the Pat, it does have many entrances, you know, that was talked about. Uh, and you enter into it. Uh, so uh, it's it's um five meters high. So it's you know, so it's kind of it's kind of not that uh I'll, I bump my head, you know, and I won't, I'm not about five meters, I'm not about tall, so I'm joking. It's, it's it's pretty tall. Um so what happens is is that is that you go through the entrance and it slopes gradually. And there are 500 niches on each side of the wall that were that once held lamps to illuminate this passageway. The first part of this tunnel goes for about 270 feet. And then there's suddenly you reach today a dividing a parting of ways with one tunnel remaining straight leading to the inner sanctuary which is 120 feet away, and another going down 290 feet to reach this muddy pond that was believed to be the river Styx. And it kind of dead ends there. <laughs> now, the passage that goes directly to the upper sanctuary is directly oriented towards the sunset at the time of the summer solstice. So you can see that the Sybil uh, you know, observed of uh, this solar uh, event, right? Uh, now the passage, the sending, went, as I said, to this Styx muddy pond. And um, this is where the priests dwelt. They dwelled on the this other side. They dwelt by the this muddy pond. The Sybil was there. And there's a, like, there's like a little landing there as well. But it doesn't go any further. I mean, does it go to the underworld? It doesn't seem to go any further. But the belief is, is that they basically those who are visiting uh, the Sybil, as well as those who are orchestrating things, made sure that their visitors were, how do I say this, um, in a state of mind where they would think that uh, they are entering the under underworld through this interest way. So <laughs> you get my drift. So probably some kinds of uh, drugs. Uh, mushrooms, other kinds of things, just to get them in the mood, right? So there you have it. So what happens now, the earliest reference uh, to the command Sybil uh, dates back to the third century BCE. And so we have that. And uh, But um, we do have, um, uh, it was seen to be a tourist attraction too. We do have from the fourth century CE, we do have a reference to it, and I'll read this too. He says, you could easily learn the true religion, at least in part. So this is person's writing uh, in the 4th century CE, so the 300s, about this cave. Learn about the true religion, at least in part, from the ancient Sybil. By virtue of powerful inspiration, she teaches you through oracles things that seem to come close to the teachings of the prophets. This is a Christian who's writing this. She is said to have come from Babylon and to be the daughter of Borysus, the author of the Chaldean history. She is said to have moved, I don't know how, to the region of Campania and to have uttered there her oracles in a certain place called Kume. This is the city that is located six miles from the city of Baye, where the hot springs of Campania are located. When we arrived in the city, we saw a certain place where we discerned a large basilica hewn out of one rock, a very big and very admirable piece of work. People who received the local tradition from their own ancestors told us that this was the place where the prophetesses used to utter her oracles. In the middle of the basilica, they showed us three cisterns hewn out of the same rock. They told us that after these had been filled with water, she used to take a bath in them, and having put on her garment, she used to stride into the innermost room of the basilica, which was also hewn out of the same rock. 
sitting on a throne on a high platform in the middle of the room. She uttered her oracles. When we were in the city, we learned these things ourselves from the tourist guides. <laughs> they showed us also the places she prophesied and the flask made of bronze in which they said her remains were kept. So this this civil, right? Uh, you know, was even though she's no longer around, it was very it was a, it was a tourist attraction during the 300s CE. <laughs> yeah, you know, you always have tourists. Well, now the most popular story related to the Sybil of Kume, beyond the one told uh, connected to Aeneas, which we just mentioned, occurred during the reign of Tarquinius Superbus. Tarquinius Superbus, what a name, you know? <laughs> so this is the last uh, Etruscan king out of the seven kings, and for good reason with a name like Tarquinius Superbus. I mean, a name like that would go to your head. Anyway. So what happens is this, around 500 BCE, this venerable Sibyl approached this renowned, very haughty king with nine books of her prophecy, a sacred collection from the wisest prophets and seers of antiquity. The Sibyl told the king that he could have this collection of great wisdom, but it's going to, it's going to be a high price. <laughs> when the king heard how much it was, <laughs> You know, uh, you know, even though in, in case the entire wisdom of the gods and fate of humanity, uh, he refused to pay up. Uh, he wished for a more moderate price. No, I'm not going to pay, not at all, uh, for these works. Mm. So he refused to do so. She had nine books, right? Without hesitating, the Sybil immediately burned three of the books. Then proceeded to offer the remaining six books the same price. Again, Tarquinius Superbus refused. Then the Sibyl threw three more books onto the fire. And then she says, and there's only three left now, and says, are you going to pay? And she wanted the same price. She, he realized that he's in big trouble. And so he paid the price. He paid the price that she asked for. For the three, even though he got it, could have got the nine. So those were erased. That's the price for hubris. So what happens then? She received her pay, and then accordingly, she disappeared from amongst men, according to Dionysus. She disappeared. So her wisdom is now given. It's written. These uh, these oracles were believed vested with incredible power for telling the future of the city of Rome. Uh, they were stored on the Capitoline Hill in Rome. At first, uh, two patricians in, were in charge of guarding and maintaining the, these books, these oracles from antiquity. Uh, now, references uh, to the oracles are found in many Latin sources. Now, for the original sibling oracles that date before the destruction of the Temple of Jupiter in 82 BCE. Livy proves to be the most prominent source. According to uh, the oracles, uh, were consulted in 399 BCE following a pestilence. And so, uh, so what happens here, there is their consult. So what do we do? Uh, we have a pestilence, what's going on here? And the result was what's called a, um, a lectisternium, a lectisternium ceremony. So they consult her, they consult the oracle, and they and she says, you got to do, uh, because of this pestilence, uh, you got to do this lectisternium um, ritual. And what is this? So lectum uh, means to spread, and sternum, of course, the drapes. is the draping of the couch a ritual. So what happens is that uh, these, basically the divine images were created using bundles of sacred herbs. They were all tied together and uh, they were made into the form of a head as well as a body. The head was covered by a waxen mask. So it kind of resembled that of a bust, right? And then it was laid upon a couch with the left arm resting on a cushion. And so it looked like it's basically a resting, inclined bag of sacred herbs meant to look like a deity. 
The couch was then set out into the open street and a meal was placed before it on a table. Uh, now, in the case of this event, however, uh, the oracle said that three couches were to be prepared for three pairs of gods, one for Apollo and Latona, the second for Hercules and Diana, the third for Mercury and Neptune. Interesting, they have these two gentlemen uh, together. The feast was the last for eight days, and, um, and there you have it. So basically, uh, you know, uh, for this pestilence to go away, you got to you gotta feed the gods <laughs> and uh, make these representations made out of herbs, put masks on them, have them reclining on couch couches, put them before a low table, put them in front of your house, and whoo, the pestilence will pass you by. <laughs> uh, in uh, in 367 BCE, uh, they added more officials. Five patricians of five plebeians were then uh, guarding the books. Now, what happens is that when they read these works, the predictions of the future, the prophecies were kept quiet because they don't want people to know the future in public. But when it came to that's but when it came to what you're supposed to do for the immediate situation, then, then of course they would use it. So basically, uh, these prophecies would talk about all these events are supposed to happen and what you're supposed to do with each event. But they're not going to tell you. Uh, they're not going to, you know, those who are watching these oracles are not going to tell you what they are ahead of time. Uh, but when that occasion comes about, they'll tell you what is prescribed for that occasion. You guys got that? Well, this becomes really important because uh, accordingly, uh, the uh, you have uh, what happens here is that um, uh, using these works, Greek religion, because all of a sudden Greek, Greek religion enters in by way of these oracles, and as a result, really helps to create an amalgamation between Roman religion and um, uh, and uh, Greek religion. When, of course, a plague occurs, they, they consulted this again. Um, uh, at one point, Livy states that a shower of stones rained down and darkness filled the sky during daylight in 345 BCE. And so the oracles were opened. Uh, and so rituals were said to happen then, a special um, holiday. Pestilence hit Rome again in 295. And, um, uh, and so... With even the army of Appius Claudius struck by lightning, the oracles were consulted with the Temple of Venus built near the Circus Maximus. In fact, what happens is oftentimes the oracle is going to ask for a temple to be built, and that's going to appease whatever terrible disaster is about to occur. Well, one of the most dramatic events concerns the oracles uh, during the, uh, the Second Punic War. And so the recommendation comes about that uh, that in order for Rome to be safe from Carthage during the Second Punic War, the image of the goddess Kibli had to be brought from Piscinius to Rome. That's where the prediction came from, is from these oracles. So they brought this, this goddess, this, this foreign Asiatic, goddess from Piscinius to Rome, and yes, they, they survived. Well, okay, so you have this oracle being, being uh, consulted, so you're thinking, okay, so we got it, we're done. Well, guess what happens? What happens is in 82 BCE, these sacred books were destroyed in the burning of the Temple of Jupiter. The Temple of Jupiter burned to the ground. It burned these oracles. What are we going to do? We've lost these oracles. And panic occurred. And then they thought, wait a second. A sibyl is a sibyl, right? You get where we're going with this one? So, uh, you know, um, so to compensate for this loss, these various represent re representatives were sent all around the known world in 76 BCE to find some of the sources for this lost collection of wisdom. Tacitus mentions this. Accordingly, then they created a brand new 
<laughs> oracles of Sybil that came from Troy, Erythrae, Samos, Sicily, and of course, Africa, which is the one uh, that is uh, the Oracle of, of Amon. So wait a second. So wait, those, you getting this? Are you guys following this? So that means, is that, remember all those other symbols I mentioned? <laughs> well, you know, uh, this, this one burned. So what they did is they quickly grabbed uh, the prophecies from these other places, they bundled them up together, and they made a new set of orders. And by the way, nobody ever tells you that. It's not very clear, uh, even in scholarship, that, hey, we have a new <laughs> uh, group of oracles to be consulted. Yes, and now you know why we went through all those, because now they're all getting rolled in. This new collection was deposited, in the again, in the new temple of Jupiter. Uh, and... Um, and with other sayings from the Tebertine Sybil as well added in. And so there you have it. Okay, so now uh, the, it, the predictions are being used again, over and over again. Um, I can't mention them all because there's quite a list here. I'll just give you a kind of a, an outline here. In 55 BCE, when Romans uh, deliberated sending a force to restore Ptolemy, uh, the, uh, uh, the 12th to the throne of Egypt, Lightning struck the statue of Jupiter on the Alban Mount. Immediately, the oracles were consulted with one reading. If the king of Egypt comes to you asking for assistance, refuse him, not your friendship, yet do not grant him any army, or else you have to toil in danger. These are the kinds of, of oracles you will get. In 44 BCE, Suetonius records that the sublime prediction uh, that only a king could triumph over Parthia, which then fueled rumors that Caesar leader of the then Republic, was aspiring for kingship. And guess what? He was. You know, Augustus uh, Caesar decided to move these oracles from the Temple of Jupiter uh, to the Temple of Apollo on the Palatine Hill, where it still is being was being consulted uh, when the Tiber River flooded much of the lower parts of Rome uh, in 15 CE. One of the priests suggested consulting the books, but Emperor Tiberius actually said, don't do it. So you have it being consulted over a period of time. Well, so what's going to happen to these? You're thinking, is there going to be a moratorium on it? Yeah. So what happens now? We do have pieces, fragments of this oracle that has survived. You're thinking fragments. Wait, we're going to lose these too? Yeah. So, uh, but there you have it. In fact, there's a, uh, we have fragments uh, in Phlygian, preserves some of them, but I don't have time to read them. Uh, I, I'll just read the first part. I'm going to stop. He says, this is a quote from the original, the, the second group of, of oracles, which are, by the way, will also be destroyed. What? Yeah. So he says, when a longest span of life for humans passes, having journeyed a cycle of 110 years, remember Romans, even escapes your notice, remember all these things. To sacrifice to the immortal gods on the field along the boundless waters of the Tiber at its narrowest point. And then, of course, it goes on to specific measures. Uh, of how exactly to do it. Um, he, in fact, he says, this is so interesting, I'm sorry. He says, when night comes upon the earth and the sun has hidden its own light, perform sacrifice of dark sheep and goats to the all-generated Morai and also appease childbirth promoting Elathiah with offerings in the proper way. In that place, let the black sow swollen with piglets be sacrificed to Gaia, and let all white bulls be led to the altar of Zeus by day, not by night, for to the Oranian gods sacrifices are performed in daylight. Let Hera's shining temple receive a young steer from you, and let Phoebus Apollo, who also is called Helios, receive equal victims, Leto's son, and goes on and on. I mean, it's very long, but yeah, so we, we do have fragments. Well, you're thinking, okay, well, that's 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 good news, right? Yes. Meanwhile, you have this, you have again this pagan oracles, but you also have a a third group of oracles. I told you it gets, it gets to be a labyrinth, a third group. Yeah. So what happens is, and here you go. The first group of pagan oracles was so influential to the Romans, used as authoritative, that Hellenistic Jews 
living in Alexandria were fascinated by it, and they decided to make up their own oracles <laughs> that are posing as pagan oracles, but focus in on monotheism and also heighten the importance of Jewish ideas and Judaism in general. You guys got it? So it's running parallel to the first set of oracles. It's gaining steam. This is happening during the third into the second centuries BCE. So, so it's, it's clothed in, in a sense in, a, in this pagan sense, right? Now, uh, this, this, uh, this Jewish oracle, of course, will connect to the legends. Remember we talked about the stories of this Persian uh, 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 sibyl that is also a Jewish sibyl. So what they will do is connect with this idea and say that is the true source. We are the true source. That's where it came from. So these, these ancient pagan ones, the first set, are basically copying us because we came up with the idea in the first place and we have the true ones, right? This, this Jewish sibyl often complains that she is exhausted by the mighty spirit of God, but that she is compelled by his command to continue her utterances, his utterances. She is uh, very conscious of her divine mission to be the light to the heathen, preparing the path of men. Uh, she circulates the divine code of ethics and explains the ancient history of the Jews to the Gentiles, whom she tries to familiarize with monotheism, retaining some of the concepts of Greek mythology. Maybe we don't lend a nice, nice little over covering there. And so uh, you have now these works starting to grow. Also, they're filled with messianic prophecies. Uh, so we see that. Well, guess what's going to happen? No. <laughs> no, it's going to happen. Well, obviously, uh, Christianity grows up. Christianity arrives and they go, you know what? <laughs> we like this authoritative Jewish uh, oracles connected to the Sibyls. So we are going to take these Sibyls, uh, sibylline oracles, and we are going to interpolate Christian ideas into them. And so this set of oracles becomes Christianized. Meanwhile, <laughs> uh, remember the pagan one? Well, meanwhile, that one is, is burned, <laughs> right? Uh, remember, you know, the Temple of Jupiter. And so contemporaneous uh, to now the Christian ones is, of course, the second group of the pagan ones. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a lot of oracles. I know. And again, scholars don't know how to explain that. You can see how this can get really confusing. Well, at first, the, the Christian apologists will quote from strictly the Jewish one at first. Uh, and then eventually, uh, they'll, uh, Christians will adopt it as their own, and it will be a competing oracle uh, to the, the pagan one, or I should say the second pagan one. Justin Martyr will quote from it. The Office of Antioch will quote from uh, this, this uh, Jewish becoming a Christian oracle. Okay, and you're thinking, okay, so we take a look. We take a look at this oracle. I want to spend too much time on it, but the Jewish oracle, uh, we, we, as we have it today, uh, it really is a combination between Christian and Jewish influences. So that's, it really is. Let me take a look at it. So um, what happens is, um, so you look at the books. Oh, let's see, I'm trying here. Okay, so uh, you look at the first, first of all, the first book, uh, really a lot of it is very Jewish. It uh, has like a Jewish eschatology mixed with Stoic conceptions. Uh, book three is very Jewish. It's very, very Jewish. In fact, uh, taking a look at the references, it must have been written between 140 uh, to 124 BCE, uh, and it talks about the, the building of the Tower of Babel and the, dis the dispersion of the various peoples and quarrels amongst the three kings, Kronos, Titan, and Japetus. <laughs> Interesting, huh? Uh, and of course, there's biblical material that's kind of thrown in, uh, in, in there in various places. And so you have these oracles kind of going. Now, 
what will happen is that towards the end, they will become more and more uh, Christian in ideals. And they'll add Christian elements. Well, and you're thinking, well, what about the pagan oracles? What happened to them? Well, unfortunately, what happened to them is a, a, a general by the name of Stilicho in the year 405 burned the second group of pagan sublime oracles. He burned them. And so they don't exist anymore. Got it? So the, now the second one. So all we have left of the second group are just a bunch of quotation from ancient scholars. We no longer have that one. Well, now that that one's destroyed, as a result of that, this Jewish-Christian one gains ground and becomes more and more popular as we enter into the Byzantine period. And then, and then it starts to disappear. Uh, during the Middle Ages, it becomes less popular. But during the Renaissance, suddenly, oh, interest comes again with the Jewish Christian oracles. In fact, Michelangelo was very much into it. And he, in fact, uh, he, in the, in the uh, Sistine Chapel, uh, in his composition on prophets and sibyls, which is painted between 1508 to 1512, uh, there are figures in the vault of this chapel that show the 12 prophetic figures that, that are supposedly uh, talked about the coming of Christ. Okay, so, and they are as follows. Jonah. Jeremiah, the Persian Sibyl, Ezekiel, the Erythraean Sibyl, Joel, Zechariah, the Delphic Sibyl, Isaiah, the Cumaean Sibyl, Daniel, the, and the Libyan Sibyl. So wait a second. So, so when we get to the Renaissance, these Sibyls are viewed as predicting the arrival of, of Christ. Now, what will happen is uh, we take a look, and it turns out the Samos one, remember the one from Samos? It's the one that uh, supposedly predicted the birth of, of Christ and predicted uh, what is going to happen in his life, uh, and then it predicted aspects that they said they got confused with Peter about going to Rome and so forth. Uh, so what will happen is these oracles even the pagan ones were considered so important when, when it came to Christian apologetics that they just could not let this idea go. And so they, you know, they lost the original one. So what they did is they just made new ones and a new fancy Christian one that's based on the Jewish ones. And so you have this interesting labyrinth. But what do we gain from this? What do we know? What we gain is a story where people, they so want to know the future. They want to know, they want to have it all written out. They want it all predicted. And they want it easy. And something like these oracles appeal to some kind of higher authority. And the fact that this knowledge of the future is known, that it's coming about, gives people a sense of comfort. It's a coping mechanism that, you know, things are dire. There's problems going on. There's pestilence. There's a war going on. There's insecurity. But good news, we have this book that knows about the future, and it knows, here it is, that the future is going to continue on for a while longer. See, it gives us that confidence. So we just simply consult in this book given by special knowledge to tell us, you know, what we should do right now. We want to know what to do. A lot of scholars sit around going, yeah, what probably happened uh, is that there's a crisis going on. <laughs> and the various people who are connected to the Sybil are thinking, well, we got to figure this one out. And so they're going, OK, uh, let's make something up. <laughs> <laughs> and so they'll write an oracle piece that will fit the anxiety at that time, 
and then they, they you know, they, they polish it all out, and then they tell the people, and they they find confidence in it. Because when you take a look, even with uh, the Judeo Christian oracles of Sybil, they go on forever, and they, wow, in many ways, they resemble various instances in time, specific ones. Like, for example, uh, it will uh, the Jewish one will specifically mention this destruction of, uh, of uh, Pompeii by Mount Vesuvius. And they will say the reason why that happened in 79 CE is because Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in 70 CE. So see, this is what you get. And so you're going to see these episodes woven throughout these oracles, which makes it very rich in looking at the anxieties of the people at that time, what they were worried about, uh, as, as well as various historical episodes and what they believe could have happened or should have happened. And so uh, there you have it, uh, this, these oracles. Uh, so it looked like at first I was talking about one set of oracles and it turned out I'm talking about, well, <laughs> one, two, three that turns into number four and that's quite a bit to cover these are part of the arcane mysteries that most people today don't know about but during the renaissance and the early modern period were still looked at uh, as as something that was very important especially when it comes to apologetics uh, it seemed to assert in many ways that our belief system has uh, our christianity was preordained uh, even from an earlier period of time. But what is lost in so many different ways uh, is some of the mystery and magic of some of these texts that are forever lost. And we only get various insights into the anxieties of the, of the era from a pagan perspective. But those insights are amazing indeed. So thank you so much. <sighs> Covered a lot of materials. I'm done. I'm going to drink, drink some waters of Laid and forget everything. Okay, I'm forgetting more. What's my name again? Thank you.